Have you ever read a book and it's, it's very in your face? It's dealing with difficult themes and topics and things that are kind of just hard to talk about in general. And you kind of just, you don't know how you, you feel about it. And so part of that, the best way to kind of work through those feelings is to just start talking about it with somebody. So that's what we're going to do here today. Episode two of books that give you brain worms. We will be talking about Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit, which is a book that I, I find difficult to recommend given some of the subject matter. Uh, but at the same time, I, I feel as, as, I hate to use the word important, but like, is in an important work in terms of like what it's what it's dealing with and some of what it's dealing with i'm not even certain that like i i grasp fully i'm not sure if i'm the person to talk about a, a lot of this stuff uh that's uh, that's that's a thing that we will get into but it, most of like it's, it's just a work that made me think and so that, that's what we established this show to be. That's what we wanted it to be. We wanted it to be about books that we kind of couldn't stop thinking about. Books that made us kind of question, you know, things that we believe, things that, like, we we think should be in books. And that, this this book does a lot of that. And so I, I think it's, it is a book that's worthy of discussion. I just wanted to say, before we really dive in, I, I wanted to get that disclaimer out of the way. That... <sighs> A lot of this, if I say something that like maybe it doesn't say in the book or if I say something that like maybe it is wrong or that I come out like later in being like, hey, I don't I don't know if I got that right. It's because a lot of this video is going to be me trying to work through like my feelings of the books. I think it's, it's doing a lot of interesting things. I think it's doing a lot of important things. And I, I just... I think, I think with books like this, they, it takes time to grapple with them. And I think part of grappling with a book is like discussing what it has to say. And so that's, that's what we're doing here today. I think that's a long enough preamble. Let's just, let's dive into the book. You know, I, I started the first episode of this series kind of giving like a, a brief plot synopsis of the book and again this is this is just like that last book this is full spoilers if you haven't read the book i mean maybe you want to listen to like the concepts of the themes and everything because like before you read it maybe you, it, it'd be worth it to know like what is going on in this book before you decide to dive in or not and i honestly like i i think a plot synopsis for this book is is fairly I mean, it's, it's easy to give, but I don't think it tells the whole story of what the book is doing, right? And so, the basic plot synopsis is a, um, it, it focuses on two women, and something happened to them. It is a haunted house story. Something happened to them in that haunted house, and it's three years later after that event, and they're in very, they don't speak to each other, they're in very different places in their life. And basically, they kind of come to this conclusion that they have to come back together to face the haunted house head on. And that seems like a simple enough premise, right? But at the same time, I, I, I don't think this is a book. And again, I, ha I hate saying this, too, because I think books can be about things. But I also think books have to work as books. And I, I think, I, I think like the story has to work. The characters have to work. If, if that stuff doesn't work what you're trying to say with your book is going to fall flat because like people are, are checked out. They don't care. You haven't given them anything to care about. All you're doing is, is preaching. I'm, I'm not going to say that this book is preaching. I don't, I don't think that it is. I think it does have a, a compelling, a compelling story at its core. I do think the mystery is good. I did want to know what was happening in this house. I wanted to know about like what happened between these two girls and what happened so I, I do think it's there, but at the, at the same time, I say that to say, I, while the haunted house aspect of the story works, while the complex relationship between these two women works, I would argue a lot of what the book is doing has nothing to do with the plot. And a lot of what this book is doing is a lot of what this book has to say. 
Um, and I get, let's briefly mention that now. This book is about a trans woman in Britain. And our main character, Alice, is a trans woman who had a falling out with her friend, Isla, who is a TERF, a trans-exclusive radical feminist. And this book is very much about the politics of Britain and anti-trans rhetoric that's going on over there and laws that are being passed over there. I, I struggle to say that, like, I know a lot about that. Like, I don't. I, I think it's probably comparable to the United States, although over there, based on what I can find, like they're, they're legitimately trying to pass laws like to prevent you from openly talking about like being trans or to prevent you from like living, not, not, not like living that kind of lifestyle, but like kind of like trying to deny people the right to be who they are. And so in, in that aspect, I don't think we've gotten that bad in the United States. I mean, like the rhetoric in the United States is probably pretty bad, but I don't think we've gone as far as like attempting to pass laws against it currently at time of recording in America that could change any moment. But I I guess that like that raises like the big question, like the elephant in the room. Like I'm not trans. I'm not from Britain. I'm not from the UK. I've never been there. I don't follow their politics very closely. I don't know what it's like to be a trans woman, but I, so I, I, I say all of that to say, like, that's why I grappled with even like talking about this book. Cause there's a part of me that, that, that does think that like, I don't have anything to say about those topics. Cause like, I don't experience those topics. But then there's another part of me that thinks to limit the discussion about this book to just those two elements is a mistake. And I, 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 I think, Anyone is able to write anything, and anyone is able to discuss anything, as long as you're you're coming at it from the right place, right? Like this is not. I'm obviously not going to be like, oh, this book sucks. It's about trans. Like, no, like that's ignorant. It's stupid. I'm sure those takes exist on Goodreads on Twitter. That's not what I'm here to talk about because I think, you know, while I can't dive deeply into the trans experience in Britain. I think this book kind of uses that to lay groundwork and then kind of by the end transcends that. And I will go deeper into what I think that means. But I do think that this book has layers. There has lots of things to talk about. And while arguably you might connect more with this book if you're from the UK, you might connect more with this book if you're trans and can connect to like people experiencing similar things to you. Like there's an inherent connection there. But at the same time, I'm not limiting the discussion to just those two things because I think this book has things that can resonate with everybody. And that's why I I think ultimately it's a book worth discussing because if you can take out those two elements and you still have so many things that apply universally, well, you've written something worth talking about. And so that's that's kind of where I'm at at like the making of this video. I... I also really dislike this idea like that 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 seems to exist I, whether like consciously or subconsciously I'm not really going to say but there's 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 this thing that happens where you know people of color write books uh, trans people write books you know people of various religious sects write books and they kind of like blow up from from those books right they they start to garner attention and then when they try to do something that's not about that experience, people kind of like rebel against it and they go, wait, 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 no, 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 no. Like you're, we read you because you were a black author. Like we want, we want to know about like the black experience. That's why we're reading your books. You're like, no, 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 you blew up because you wrote a book about trans experience. And wh- what, what are you doing talking about like something that's not the trans experience? Like that, that kind of attitude like grossly exists. And so I, I think to, like, limit this book to the discussion of just, like, the trans aspect or the UK aspect does a disservice to the author because you're saying that, like, well, the only thing you really have things to say about is these two things. And I think that is gross and just wildly just, like, wrong and dumb. Like, people of all varying backgrounds have things to say about everything, not just the things from those backgrounds that make them, like, unique and, like, different. Like, 
to, to, to say that, like, you can only speak about your differences from everybody else, like, it's just gross and, like, it will get us nowhere. It, it'll just create circles where, like, these books are never intersecting, like, they're never finding a wider audience because we kind of are trying to tell these authors, like, what they can and cannot write about, like, what experiences are valid for them to write about. And I, I, I just, I hate that. I mean, I think... You know, obviously, I'm not trying to like give permission, but I I think authors should be free to speak about whatever they damn well please, as long as they're doing it in compelling ways. People will engage with the work, and this is, you know, where we're however many minutes into this video already, that just giving this long preamble, and I think like it's time to really like engage with the work, and I I think it's true like of this book, like I think. Alison Rumford like has something to say about the trans experience, but I, I think she has something to say about a lot more than just that, that is layered throughout the book. And so just like, you know, our last video, this video is kind of broken into three parts. I would say it's kind of more intro, middle, outro. Uh, but those parts would be the introduction. We're going to talk about pop culture and books. We're going to talk about the transgressive nature of this book. Then we have to talk about the house, the haunted house. We have to talk about what that means, the F word that this book is mentioning, so to speak. And then we have to talk about the outro. We have to talk about where, where do we go from here? This book is pointing out a lot of things wrong in the UK, a lot of things, a lot of bad things that are happening. Does the author present solutions? What do we do? And it's, it's unfair to assume that they have solutions like how could no like no one person can have the solution to some of the things that they're pointing out but what, what are they suggesting that we do what are they suggesting like how how do we move on from this and so we will touch on that in the outro but enough of a precursor enough preamble enough just covering all the bases of like things that i feel like i need to say before we really start diving into this book and so now We've done all that. Let's get into it. Part one. Transgression in pop culture. This this is a work of what, what I would deem transgressive fiction. And if you're unfamiliar with transgressive fiction, uh, a brief Wikipedia search will tell you that transgressive fiction is a genre of literature which focuses on characters who feel confined by the norms and expectations of society and who break free from those confines in unusual or illicit ways. Typically, very explicit and in-your-face depicts depictions of graphic sexuality and violence. You know, that, that's, that's a fairly good summary. But I, it's very vague. And so like, what I think transgressive literature is at its core is that it's, it's literature that's you know, it, it, it's in your face. It, it has something to say. It's going to upset a lot of people. It's going to offend a lot of people. And almost the, the, the point of the book almost is to elicit that kind of reaction. That, does, that doesn't mean that, it, that it's taking away from some of the things that the book has to say. But a lot of what the book is doing is, is invoking a reaction. And a lot of what the book, like, even if that's through, like, graphic depictions of sex or through like constant drug use by characters or even just like by really diving deep into sort of taboo like frameworks like for example like a book like Lolita probably would be considered transgressive by modern standards because it is literally like exploring like attraction to minors right a very taboo idea in society but that that is something that that book is exploring and so that's kind of what transgressive fiction is doing. It is exploring in a usually graphic detail to invoke reactions, some more taboo aspects of society. And so that's like what this one's doing. This is what a lot of what this book is doing. It has very like graphic depictions of sex, of violence, of drug use. Why go this route? Because, like, it, it immediately is going to turn off a large percentage of the audience. Like, a lot of people aren't going to want to read about graphic depictions of sexual relationships between people. Not just trans people, like, people in general. Or they're not going to want to hear about heavy drug use. There's some some self-harm in this book. And then there like, just weird depictions of sexual violence. Yeah, all of that, like, elicits a reaction, right? It, it, it makes you kind of go, 
Ooh, I, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know about that. I don't, mm, I don't like that. Um, nope, not, not a fan. And a lot of what this book does is like I, I can't even like read excerpts from it because it is very, you know, explicit, and it probably like will get flagged for some reason or another. Or like, again, I don't want to like subject people to this if they're watching it but don't want to read the book. Like, I don't want to subject them to this. To like the transgressive nature of the book, if it's not something that they want, if it's not something that they're prepared for, so I, I'll I'll try not to read passages and just kind of vaguely explain some things. But you know, our our main character Alice really talks a lot, like like openly about being trans, how like that is for her in the UK. It talks very openly about like some of the things that she experiences. And it talks like in, in a very graphic way, like how kind of awful some of these situations have been. And, you know, it depicts a lot of drug use. It depicts sex work. It depicts kind of a lot of various things that I think are like hot button issues. It talks it, like I, I do think she goes into some areas that will make a lot of people uncomfortable because they don't want to confront that that side of life exists for people and i think that is a big reason as to why allison rumford is so in your face about it like is so aggressive in the way that she's writing in the way that she's telling this story is because you know like it makes you uncomfortable but like but like you know what like it's uncomfortable for them as well like to experience and so you know there there's a book a like there's a there's a moment in the book where like she not Alice, but her friend Isla is, um, like, having sex with a woman, right? And it's a very, like, graphic depiction of it. And then in the middle of their what, what they're doing, Isla refers to her as a, like, transgender slur. And they don't say, like, what the slur is, but, like, you know what the slur is. And then, like, she's kind of, like, accused of, um, of like, coming on to a woman at a meeting, like... All of these things. And then, like, adding the turf aspect, like, that's obviously going to be very uncomfortable for a lot of readers. But, like, why why does it describe these things? Like, what, why do I feel that the transgressive nature of this book is important? And th th this may not be true for all transgressive works. Like, some transgressive works are trying to push buttons, are trying to push the limits of fiction, and that's kind of what they're doing. I don't think that's what Alison Rumford is doing here. I think it is a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more layered than that. I think at times she's going to say things that would trigger like people on both sides of the aisle. Like there, there is an aspect to this book where, like, where she kind of like recognizes that like some turfs have a point or like, and that she recognizes that you know, like, some people are just hateful and disgusting and, like, despicable, but yet, like, we have some weird tie to them, right? There's, we'll get into this when we talk about the pop culture, but, like, she has a poster on her wall of a famous singer who has said terrible things that, like, she won't take down. And, like, there's a part of her that has to wrestle with the idea that, like, she has these deep emotional ties to this person who, like, she can't, couldn't fathom being in the same room with. And so, like, what I what I think the transgressive nature of this book is doing is that it's confronting people. And it's saying, like, oh, like, is, is this uncomfortable for you to read? Like, it's uncomfortable for us to experience. And so, like, I think Alison Rumford is aware that most of the audience that reads her book will not be trans, will not be people who have experienced this firsthand. And so, in order to, like, kind of get you into that mind frame, if that is something that's possible... She's going to say all of these things and she's going to describe all these things in great detail to elicit like this reaction to go, oh, OK, well, like, does that make you uncomfortable? OK, it's uncomfortable for us to experience, too. And so, like, now you have a taste of that. It'll never like measure up to the like actual thing that we deal with. But like, at least you now have a frame of mind for it. And so I, I also think this book is written, a lot of it is written like with a, a deep like, anger. And I think you, you feel that I, 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 there's, there's, there's an anger to the writing style, a lot, a large portion of it. I think it's because Alison Rumpert is, is justifiably angry about things that they have to experience in the UK right now. 
And, you know, there's there's a brutality to these depictions of violence because it's it's meant to stir those kinds of emotions. It's meant to, like, look you in the face and say, oh, you don't like reading this? That's too bad because we don't like experiencing it. Like, all you have to do is read it. We have to live it. And I think that is kind of the line Alison Rumford is drawing and kind of the reasoning why she's using such, like, brutal and in-your-face language and, like, narrative structure to, like, really drive home the fact that, like, you have the comfort of putting this book down and walking away. We don't have that. So while I have your attention, like, I'm really going to drag you through the shit here. And so I, I really respect that style of writing. I really respect what she was doing with this book. And so I, I think, like, at the same time that like, you have to wrestle with the idea, like, if it didn't invoke that kind of reaction if you're going like for this more transgressive style and you didn't invoke that kind of reaction you didn't like really go there you didn't like send it home the way you that like transgressive literature usually does well then like the book would have failed like if people read all these graphic depictions of things and feel nothing like well then your your book doesn't work there's there's nothing to talk about because it didn't hit anybody and so that's that's a, another big component of transgressive literature which is like just eliciting that response like means the book is a success if it got you to think about like these things or got you to feel a certain way about things that are described well the book is succeeding if you felt nothing like the book would be failing and so i think that is a little bit like what the book is doing when it does these like very graphic depictions of you know the house and like the sexual violence in the book while it's it's not comfortable to read like it's not supposed to be so i think like it's, it's the difference between like popular fiction and like transgressive fiction would be like popular fiction would really like w would hint at something terrible had happened and like would kind of like glaze over it some to like kind of i want to please as many readers as i can whereas this is like i don't have any interest in pleasing readers like you're gonna read about this or you're gonna step away and not read the book like you're going to face this head. You don't get to have these deep, challenging themes and just glaze over them. If you want to have these challenging themes about sexual violence, about, you know, like violence against certain members of communities, like about trying to literally deny people rights. You want to have those themes. You want to deal with those themes. Well, then you have to really deal with them and you can't just glaze over them because it will make people uncomfortable you, you, you have to tackle it head on. And so a tremendous amount of respect to Alison Rumford for just fucking going there. Just not being afraid to like push buttons, not being afraid to say things that will make people upset because eliciting a reaction will start a conversation. And then from there is what I think like the book is, is really doing. It's trying to start that conversation. And so like kudos. I, I really enjoy transgressive works I, I love a lot of them i love a lot of like that style of writing and so i think this book like really nailed that for me and i really enjoyed like large aspects of that the second thing that we kind of need to tackle in this section this, this introduction so to speak this rather long introduction is the the pop culture element of this book you know it references things like uh, Shirley Jackson it references things like, you know, like Twitter and message boards and like sites for people to pay like for sex work. It, it references, um, you know, like the bloody chamber. It references Bluebeard at one point in this. Like there's the references are all over the place. Not all of them are inherently modern. And, you know, there's th there's an element to this that I think it's it's important to discuss, you know, especially since we I mentioned it already the poster like the the quote-unquote like ghost that kind of haunts alice outside of the house that seems to be following her wherever she moves right like it's a it's a poster of a singer like she's got crossed out the eyes and they never name who the singer is the book doesn't but i think it gives enough kind of clues for you to figure it out if, if you're if you like british music i should say like if you only listen to, you know, country music, you probably will have no idea who the person is. But it doesn't really matter. Like, what matters is that, like, it's, it's like a real person who has said somewhat awful things. And, like, it's kind of like wrestling, like, with your relationship. Like, 
it, it would essentially be like if Jay, if someone wrote this book like in 10 years and like use like JK Rowling and like trying to wrestle with that idea of like, well, I hate this person, but I really like like what they've done. And like, I don't know, this is kind of a thing that's like part of my life. Like, how can I just completely distance myself from it when I have all of these like memories of it? And like, it's, it's, it's that similar idea, but just like using a different figure. And so like the, the, the use of pop culture in a book, uh, it, Caroline Ketmus does it in the U series, and I think that helps that series like feel like it's it's in a very direct, specific time and place. I, I, I would say typically I don't care for it. I like books that feel timeless. I like books that feel like they could take place in any time. I don't like things that inherently date it to a specific place in time. But... With that being said, you could throw the argument at this book that, like, oh, all the things you've put in here are going to date this book. In 10 years, like, a lot of people won't know what you're referring to. And while that's true, I do think that that is worth discussing. At the same time, I would argue that in 10 years, this book will probably still resonate with people. But if it resonates with people in the same way, like, we, we, we've kind of failed. And, like, we, we will have made no progress. And while, you know, I, I don't want to say that, like, we failed. Like, that's kind of harsh. But, like, I think this book isn't interested in being timeless. It's interested in commenting on the here and now. It's interesting in talking about what people are experiencing in today's world. And so, yes, like, the book will be dated but at this certain point like it'll also be sort of like a, a relic of the past where it'll be a good glimpse into well what were people in this place in this time thinking at the time i think some books are timeless but like some books are also meant to capture a moment in time and i would say that's where this book falls i think this book very much is attempting to capture the here and now of this author's life in the things that they experience in Britain, in the laws that are trying to be passed. I don't think, I think that like this book is very pressing. This book has like an urgency to it. That is like, these are, this is what we're dealing with. Like we need to overcome this. Like we will need help overcoming this. Like th this is, it, it's kind of like the reason that it resonates so much because you can like, see things that happen and correlate them to real life things that you see happen. It has that emotional impact because you see it and you're like, oh no, like this is a work of fiction, but I know someone that that happened to. Like I, these events are all too real for people like living in today's modern world. So while yes, you could argue this book is going to be dated at the same time, I don't think it's trying to be timeless. I think it is trying to comment on a very specific moment in time, and it is the one we are currently experiencing. I, I, I think the big thing that the book does well is that like there, there is a fear and there's a horror that these characters like have to experience, not just with the haunted house, but in their everyday life. And you know, it, it comments on things like isla being canceled or it comments on things about like you know trans women and sex work which is like a lot a lot of the time how that plays out like they, they they don't feel like they can go anywhere else to do any other kind of work so they get they they just resort to sex work and like if that's what they want to do that's fine but there's there seems to be a component to alice's character like that doesn't really want to be doing this but it is a way to make money she feels uncomfortable with the things that she's being asked to say there is an element to the people receiving on the other end of like well yeah, outwardly in public they might be very against the things that they are inherently asking for and so it is about like these hidden desires that people have that they don't want anyone to know about that they can just go to some private online chat room and like espouse everything that they really feel without fear of people in their life like calling them on it because it's anonymous on the internet. And so it's dealing with these real life fears and these real life horrors that people have to experience every single day. It makes them like so palpable. It makes these characters feel as if 
it's being enacted like right in front of your face because a lot of the times it is like it may not be happening to Alice and Isla in the real world but like you know someone who this is happening to you maybe you are the person who outwardly says one thing but then goes on the internet and says something else like or you know someone who is trans and people in their life don't want to call them by their respected names the reason that the horror and the fear in this book works so well is because it is so palpable and in your face and it is something that you have probably have experience with unlike a lot of other horror books that like i've read like the home invasion story like from the cabin at the end of the world like i have no experience in a home invasion but in a book like this like i can see elements even if i'm not trans or from the uk which is why i said i don't want to limit that discussion to just those two things i've seen elements of like people with self-harm so again that's why the horror of the book works because it is so real and that transgressive style of writing about it, that in your face writing about it, it doesn't allow well, like, much like these carnal desires that are being portrayed on the internet, but not in real life. This book doesn't allow you to hide in the shadows. It doesn't allow you to just gloss over it and like get the gist of what it was. It really wants you to wrestle with it. And so that's why I think the book horror of the book works so well that's why i think the book is so eloquently written it's in your face it's aggressive because it needs to be because there's a, a genuine anger behind it because it is expressing things that we are all probably all too familiar with and yet we know about them but like what are we really doing about it and this book is like forcing you to at least wrestle with it forcing you to at least come to terms with these things that are happening and that style is not going to be for everyone, but it sure like was for me. Part two, the F word. Before the house was built, it existed. The ground that it grew on was all wrong. Far beneath the earth, corpses lay which were older than God. And so when they raised the house, it was already there in a way, fully formed, ready, ravenous. No live organism can continue to exist compassionately under the conditions of absolute fascism even the birds in italy under mussolini were observed to take part in rallies and violence all beyond not compassionate not sane stood ringed by a tangled forest holding inside however messily its overpowering ideology it had stood so for a hundred years but would only stand for one more before it entered into the long process of becoming something else at the end of which it was hoped it would seem to all the world that it had always been that way. Within floors crumbled, ceilings gaped open, vines choked the chimneys and windows. We have arrived at what the book is really kind of talking about, which is fascism. And I will admit, when I read that and I read the back and i read that phrase no organism can live under conditions of absolute fascism i rolled my eyes a little bit because i think fascism has become one of those overused terms that is used to like describe people that you don't agree with but i think the book avoids that trap i think the book avoids that trap by a presenting isla who is a turf who obviously Alice and probably Alice and Rumfit does not agree with pre presenting them as a real person, presenting them with actual reasonings for like why they are that way. You know, like that goes a long way. It's not, they're not just a person to play the boogeyman that to you to like curse out and for you to like hate. They have real genuine complex emotions that led to that point in life. And so, yes, I do think this book is dealing with, fascism in the truest sense of the word like trying to dispel all personal identity like in terms of what is best for the state it is it is 100 percent about state control over ideas state control over what is and isn't acceptable in life like that like conditions of absolute fascism and so before we get into that we kind of need to give a little bit of history of House, of the House, who goes by the name Albion in the book. First, we will cover 
the history of the house within the book. And then we will cover like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to us? So in kind of like in the middle of the book, we kind of take a break from Alice and Isla's point of view. The book kind of switches back and forth between Alice and Isla. And we oftentimes get the house's perspective. The house's name is Albion. And then we get to a point where we actually get the full backstory of the house, right? So, so the, the, it kind of originates with a man named Edmund and his wife, Emily, and they are destined to live in the house. And in, in that passage on page 149 and 150, we see that like the house is alive and the servants who I don't think ex explicitly told that they are like people of color, but I, I think it's, I think it's safe to assume given the time period and the fact that they're called servants, uh, that they, they don't like the house. The house makes them uncomfortable. And so they don't they don't feel welcomed in the house so that's an important thing to keep in mind and then kind of it, it goes into the story of how edmund becomes interested in eugenics and the differences between the races and edmund begins to bring uh, at first like begins to bring like women of color back to any back to the house and he takes them to their office and then they disappear they're never seen again and so his wife obviously becomes like a little suspicious and Emily, like she doesn't like this. Like she's jealous at first. She doesn't understand why he's spending all this time with these women. Like what is he doing with these women? Why is he not spending any time with her? So that, 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 that sets up that sort of little component of the house. And then we have a passage where one night he brings like a white woman home and Edmund comes out of his study. The woman does not. And then on page 153, we have the line, this time, Emily felt brave enough to ask him. She steeled herself and said, That woman, who was she? Where did she go? He was silent, and she was sure she had crossed the line. But then he spoke. That, my dear, he said, was not a woman. I found it in Bristol, pretending to everybody around him that he was a woman. And he put on quite the performance, you know. Nearly had me fooled, too, but I found him fascinating, you know. He had received some sort of rudimentary surgery. He had lost his manhood, as it were. And here is where the house sort of kicks into where it's important for us in this book with these characters. We are establishing the anti-trans roots of the house. This goes on. He begins to bring home more guests. They grow more and more distant as a couple until Emily just like, can't take it anymore. She has to know what is inside. She goes inside, but like it's it's there. She finds nothing. He's away out of town. She decides this is the moment. I'm gonna do it now. And she doesn't find anything, and obviously, Edmund discovers that she's been in the room, and she must be punished now. And he says to her, "Oh, my poor little jealous wife! I can't beat you for that, dear. You want to know what I do in my room to all those guests I have? Fine, I will show you. I will do the same to you." And then we have this passage that kind of wraps up this section, this history of the house, with this. At the last moment, she realized that she did not, in fact, want to know what had happened to all those other women. Scores of them, over the time they had lived there, countless amounts, led into this very position, never to return, not once. If this was a jest, a punishment, a sexual act even, she would very much like it to stop. Emily was frightened, the most frightened she had ever felt. She opened up her eyes again and began... To try to scream but the gag was tied too tight around her mouth to even breathe properly let alone cry for help her eyes registered something undefinable it blotted out the light that shone down hot from above her it cast a shadow across her face was it edmund it was dark and faceless and red the red of it dripping all around her filling up her eyes and her mouth investigating between her legs 
Red tore the fabric of the gag and slid down her throat into her lungs and her stomach. Albion reached inside her, all around her, nestled against her, gnashed its teeth and ripped at her flesh. You're useless. You're useless. You're fucking useless. It screamed closed in her ears so that she could feel its hot breath against her skin. This is what happened. This is what it's found. This is what it felt like. They found Emily's body a week later beneath one of the pine trees near the house. Her womb and vagina had been surgically removed, although where the organs had gone was not clear. The servants knew nothing at all. She had been there one day, they said, and then she was gone. The master had said nothing of it when they arrested Edmund and questioned him on the matter. He refused to say anything at all, other than admitting that yes, he had killed her, that he would very much like to be hanged by the neck until he was dead. So what, is, what does this mean for us? What does that mean like about the real world? Well, I had to do like a little bit of digging about this because it was pointed out to me. I think I watched a review where someone pointed this out and then I went and like read about it. But basically the name Albion comes from ancient Greek like geographers and it's kind of like the earliest known name for Britain, the island. And so what this book is really like doing, what, what I think is the most clever trick that the book is pulling is that the house is a stand in for the country, right? What this book is saying and what it means by nothing, no living organism can exist under conditions of absolute fascism is it's saying, at least this is how I, I'm reading it, all beyond is the state. It is Britain. It is the government. And what is the government, the state, the country? What is it doing? It is operating and breeding hatred. And so no living organism can exist under conditions of extreme hatred, of extreme division. It is a system that is getting its citizens to turn on each other. It is a system that tells one side that they should hate the other and tells the other side that they should be afraid of the other. And what does that do? It complete it like it creates complete division. People don't want to talk to each other. People don't want to recognize and have empathy for other people. People want to seclude themselves to groups that they feel the most comfortable in and then live in fear of everybody else. It is the state imposing what they believe to be the right view on its citizens. And one group is saying, we agree with the state. We must eradicate everybody else that's different. And that's what the house is. The house has the idea of what is right. Right? We see oh, it, it doesn't like people of color. It doesn't like trans people. It probably isn't the biggest fan of women either. I don't think it's coincidence that he only brings home women and not men. The house is a representative of the state. And it, it is saying these are the kinds of people that we accept and these are the kinds that we don't. And it breathes this kind of hatred, this division between the ones who are in line with that and the ones who aren't the ones who are being told you are the people that we are looking for. And then it also creates this other side that is, well, we we don't fit that description. And now like those people are being told whether by media organizations, by other groups, by the government themselves, that you need to be afraid of this other side because they mean nothing but harm for you. And sometimes that's true. And sometimes that isn't. And so what you have is you have the the very extremes of both sides speaking for everybody. And no progress can be made when that is the case, which is what I think the book is doing. It's what I think the book is trying to point out. No living thing can exist under conditions of complete fascism because people will either always be living to hate something or they will always be living in fear of the other side that is told they should hate them. And so that's not a way to run society. That's not a way to live in a country. That's not a way to raise like families and be happy and have friends and relationships. Like you can't exist and live a normal life under those conditions, which is what the book is saying. And then we see how that comes to a head with our three main characters. As they approached the house, she started to feel something around her, two opposing forces, one pushing her away the other drawing her in. Her body couldn't decide what it wanted to do. She didn't ask if the others felt the same way because she didn't want them to think she was weak, but they felt it too in their own ways. Leave here now, and then 
come closer. So we get this little section about what happened three years ago. What actually took place? Why? Who is Hannah? Why is she not in the picture? Why do Alice and Isla hate each other? All of that is explained kind of in this passage. There is this house, Albion, that exists on like kind of like the outskirts. And Alice really believes that this should be a place that like should be used to house you know, people that need housing. And, you know, the the people that own the land, most likely the government, are being like very greedy. They think that they can just like rebuild it and sell it off for millions and like you just kinda have like just the rich getting richer, basically. She, she wants to break in and kind of see what it is. And they go, they enter the house, and the house seemingly like, plays tricks on them and gets them to split up. Hannah is on her own, and then you have Alice and Isla. And Hannah tries to like retreat and go back to Alice and Isla, but like she is not safe. And the house repeats to her over and over again, like, Hannah, you are home. And then the house seemingly like swallows her whole. And then when Alice and Isla are separated, they kind of begin looking for Hannah, not really sure how they split up in the first place. And eventually they find her. They're, they're, she's in the study, the, the study of Edmund. And her body, like the house takes her body and gets like contorted into a like, I don't know if I can say the word, it gets contorted into the famous symbol known by the Third Reich, right? <laughs> and so she, but before that, like she starts like saying like all these, these terrible things towards Alice and Isla, like the house has, has totally taken over her. She is spewing like anti-trans rhetoric. She uses that trans slur from earlier. Isla is trying to be like, oh, no, she's having like a mental like collapse. Like she doesn't mean this. Like, I, and I think, I think like, this, this is a key moment because we, that's like, that's our gut reaction. When someone that we care about says something that we're like, what did you just say? And it's like, no, like they, they, oh, they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. But like, maybe that they did. And like, she's trying to defend her friend. And then we get this brilliant trick that the book pulls that I loved because we know something happened between between Alice and Isla that means that they don't want to talk to each other anymore and so what we get is like three pages split down the middle and one perspective is from Hannah's left eye the other perspective is from Hannah's right eye and one is Isla's side of the story one side of the page the other side of the page is Alice's side of the story and they do not line up and so what we learn on these pages is Alice believes that Isla assaulted her and Isla believes that Alice assaulted her. And in this moment, in these split pages here, we learn that they both are correct. They, 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 they both have scars to prove it. Alice has the one on her forehead. Isla has the one across her torso. They both seemingly have evidence to be like, you did this to me. And then the other one says, no, you did this to me. And so it has created this disconnect and it has created this point where like where they hate each other rightfully so if they believe the other one has assaulted them which one actually happened and i love what the book does here by giving you both perspectives by telling you that both of them happened both events occurred and why does that matter it doesn't why do we need to know that both things happened to them which one actually happened it doesn't matter we know that they each happened and what that means what I think that is showcasing is it's showing you that the state will provide you, right? This thing that wants to exist under complete fascism, the house, the house is pulling this trick. It wants them to see something that will make them hate each other. It is the state fascism, whatever you want to call it, the house, it is them giving you information that you need to hate the other side. That is what this is doing. What we see after this is we see two women who come out on very separate sides of things saying, I hate this group or I hate this group. And that is what the house, the state, fascism needs to exist to breed within a country. It will tell you whatever information you need to get you on that side. And so that is what we are seeing. We are seeing that both women getting the information they need to hate the other side, to submit to the overall mission of the house, to create division, to breed hatred. That's what we are seeing. And I think it's genius. I, I truly believe this is a genius piece of writing, like in these few pages. And so like it, it, it is, 
It's not easy to read. Again, like going back to the transgressive nature of this book, it is very in your face in these pages. It uses like harm, like, like, like very kind of just gross in your face language to depict horrible acts. But it's what you need, right? Because if it was a soft act or softly worded, you wouldn't give as much stake to it, especially in the eyes of these two characters, right? If you didn't really go there with the description, you'd be like, oh, why are they really mad about that? But like, because you get this kind of gross out description of what happens, this real portrayal of terrible events, like you can see why one would hate the other. You would can see how deliberately the house breeds anger and hatred. And I think that is the most important point. That is what you are trying to get away from the section. That's what you're kind of come away with. And that's what Alison Rumford wants you to take away, in my opinion. And I, I, I think we see that as this sort of section carries on, where it states, Alice or Isla stumbles out into the light of day. Three girls had gone into the house believing in something, and now only two had left, believing in something else entirely. Or at least, that's how it was seemed. It had always been there, hadn't it? The potential within them, it just took the house to show them that. And again, I, I think this kind of plays in to a different component of the book that we will be talking about next, which is it gave them the information they already wanted. It, they, they are like almost conceivably <sighs> predisposed to be on one side or the other, and it just kind of, they just needed that push, right? That is what like fascism wants you to believe. It wants you to believe that like this, the way that things are now is how they've always been. And you just need to open your eyes to that. You just need to open the eyes to what the state is telling you to see that it is really true, right? It is, it's, it's, it's always been that way. Why, why are you fighting against it? Like, this is how it's supposed to be. And so we see that like, at least all it, it, the book seemingly is saying that like, and this will lead us into our next section is seemingly saying that like, no one is above this, right? Like, that, that's kind of why empathy is important, because anyone at any time could be subject to this kind of, like, manipulation, could be subject to this kind of, like, you know, propaganda and, like, hateful bigotry that, like, is targeted and pointed to, like, direct at certain individuals. Like, it is, it is very easy to see how someone could be radicalized, and it, it is pointing out that, like, no one is above this gay trans black white like latino anything right it does not matter man woman young old like suburban rich poor like whatever it doesn't matter anyone is subject to this and so like, anyone could fall victim to it because like that's how powerful of a system that it is and so that's what i think i think the book is is, is showing you that the state will give you whatever mention, whatever information it needs to convince you to be on their side. And anyone, this could happen to literally anybody. And so now that we've discussed that, what happens next? Part three, the question of empathy. Where do we go from here? I think in terms of where do we go from here, a large thing to discuss is the prologue and the epilogue, right? Isla and Alice overcome their differences. They burn the house down. They see who the real enemy is, right? And they can come together to defeat it. They know who it is. The book opens with this passage, and I, I th it opens with this line that I think is incredibly important. Long after the house is gone, it's there. That's how it ends. That's how it opens. That is the opening line of the book. And we see a like blurb from Gretchen Felker Martin, who kind of who s describes the book as being humane as it is hideous, and I think that is a great tagline as well, because we see in the beginning the the prologue and the epilogue, which will be our main focus of the section. We see how easily people get radicalized, and in this passage specifically. I think we see it, and the author is at least recognizing how easy it is, and so she writes this. The boy begins to Google some of the things that his dad says on the old computer, which 
he has at his desk. He, has give, he was given it for school, but he barely uses it for school. Instead, he mostly uses it to search for those phrases his dad repeats under his breath when he drinks too much. My dad's right, he thinks, about these things. About the immigrants and the gays and the feminists and BLM tearing down statues. Historic statues. Iconic parts of our heritage. And actually, his dad doesn't go far enough. The boy discovers forums for other people, older boys and men's mostly. Tell him about the way the world really is, a vast conspiracy of mass immigrations, of feminists, of ahistorical cultural Marxism telling lies about the past, manipulating the youth. They're in the schools, in his school too. They're diversity hires, their teachers asking for pupils' pronouns. Sometimes one of the older men asks him for pictures of himself. It seems wrong, but he sends them anyways. Pictures of him naked in the grainy camera of his webcam sent to anonymous accounts. Mostly though, they all want to stay hidden. They write out strings of slurs, they say they are going to do something. Something's coming, they tell the boy. Get ready for the storm and make sure you're on the right side. The boy thinks, well I have to make sure I'm on the right side, I have to do something. The face in the wall twists further, the mouth gets wider, the eyes get more frantic. But he doesn't have nightmares about it anymore. He doesn't wake up at night screaming. His mom and dad are happy about that at least. Maybe their strange little boy is going to be okay. They did a good job with him, right? They're doing a good job with him. Given the circumstances, given the lack of money, and the shitty flat, and the government, and the state of the world, and the way things seem to be going, they did a good job, they tell themselves. We did a good job. We're raising a good kid. We've brought up a good son. Over and over, insisting this to themselves and to anyone who will listen, repeating it until it makes them sick. And I, and I think this passage is emanating some kind of empathy. It is at least acknowledging how easily people are radicalized. And I at like, younger and younger ages, at impressionable and impressionable ages, we see things that our parents say, we see things that people in our community say, and so, like, yeah, we may have means of talking widely, but, like, for the most part, people are going to say and hear things the most that they were here repeated back to them in their community. And so, it, 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 it seems to at least be acknowledging that uh, some of this is not their fault and what i i think this is this is kind of where i i'm wrestling the most with the book where i i'm trying to see may, maybe i'm wrong about this sort of analysis but i'm kind of thinking like the book is hopeful and bleak like at the same time and large portions of this book are very bleak and large portions of this book seem to have some sort of like nuance and understanding to them but at the same time like maintaining that bleakness and so i i that's kind of where i'm like struggling and wrestling with the most because in the, the epilogue of this we see the young kid from the prologue blow up a pride parade or something of that nature and it's horrific people die I, I'm uncertain if we are left to believe that Alice dies as well. It certainly kind of seems that way. They have a very bleak, like, ending. But at the same time, like, prior to the prologue, we have a sentence saying, like, I wonder if they will be, like, okay. Like, I have to believe that they will be. And so even there, like, it's emanating some kind of hope before going into a very bleak passage, a very bleak epilogue. And I, I think ultimately where the book falls is that, like, yes, like, we have to have empathy for people. Like, that's the only way this is going to get better. We have to, like, the book is, is pointing out the enemy. It's telling you who is creating this division, who is creating this kind of hatred. And it's, it's the state. Like, it's the country, the house, whatever you want to call it, fascism. Like, that's, that's your enemy. It's not this person over here who hates you like it's like that may be a more direct like frame of like your enemy that may be a more direct way to think about it. like oh that person is against me but if you you, th if you think one step further like well how did they get that way and the book seems to acknowledge that it's fairly easy to get that way i think it's saying to have empathy but at the same time like don't just like they don't just get a get out of jail free card for that right like, empathy can only go so far. You have to at least acknowledge that they are capable of doing heinous acts. Don't excuse their heinous acts, but you have to at least acknowledge that they are capable of doing, like, bad things. Which is why 
it's humane as it is hideous. It's a very apt description of what they are describing. And there's a passage on here that, that kind of dives into that a little bit deeper. And they say, when I was about 15, this is from Alice's point of view, I used the website Tumblr. It still exists as far as I know. It was a strange place and it's hard to even describe how the culture of it felt when you were part of it. At times welcoming, at times unbearably tense. It was the first time I really read about what being trans was. And it was also where I was sent endless anonymous messages telling me to kill myself. People would often accuse others of things baselessly and those accusations would stick to them, however much they tried to shake them away. One of my Tumblr mutuals was accused of being someone attracted to children and a member of the Third Reich. We hadn't really talked much at all. She would reblogged my selfies a few times and I hadn't thought much about that until she started. people started to accuse her. I began to wonder what her intentions had been when she shared a 15-year-old selfies. She denied these accusations, of course. Anyone would. She claimed that the people accusing her of being what she was accused of being were TERFs. And the problem was that some of them were, or had at least started to share TERF rhetoric onto their blogs, which made sense. They had just been exploited by an older trans woman. And suddenly, these older women were telling them, oh, come on, come join us. There's a pattern to this. and We don't have to accept it as normal. I didn't understand it at that time. I was just angry, angry and confused. But I get it now. With Isla spooning me, I understand why she is the way she is. I hope she stand, understands why I am like I am too. And so, again, Alison Rumford is showing empathy towards that side. It's She's showing how easily people can fall into that line of thinking. And kind of like reasonably so why some might fall into that line of like reasoning. And like, it's, it's, it's not their fault. And as she says, like, we don't have to accept this as normal. That pattern, right? Like that pattern of pushing someone basically to the other extreme. We don't have to accept that that is always the case. We can break that cycle. These people won't get there like by force. And by trying to force them to be a certain way, you will inevitably force them to become what you are opposed to. And so those conversations have to happen. And so th this book seemingly is ending on a place of hope, but like with a touch of bleakness over the top. And so I, 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 I can certainly understand the criticism of, well, why should I be nice to people that want me dead? And I think that's a, that's a good question. And it's a question that I don't have, that I haven't had to deal with. And so this is where like part of what the book is saying might get a little bit lost here. where like, I am not the best person to espouse like what to do next because I'm not dealing with a lot of the things that happen in this book. The best I can do is acknowledge them and like do my part and not engaging in them. It's like it's it seems to still be hopeful that society one day will get there that like we that's why you can't hate the person that like wants to kill you because one day like when, when we finally defeat like the real enemy. We will still all have to live together. I think the book is kind of ending on this note of like, it has a dash of hope that one day things will get better. But when we end the epilogue with this explosion that kills a lot of members of the LGBTQ community, it's still, it's still acknowledging that empathy is only going to get you so far. These people are capable of committing heinous acts, even though we have to have empathy for them if we ever hope for this to get better. But at the same time, they will get better. We have to believe that's the case. But it's probably going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And it seems to be acknowledging that. But it, like, it points out, kind of like in closing, it's pointing out the big thing that I think like could be a call for people. It could be like a, a, a common thread, a way to, like, to engage with your neighbor. That it's like... Conservatives are not your enemies, liberals, trans people, gay people, black, Jewish, whatever. Any insert anything you would like. Like they are also not your enemy. The enemy is the system that is telling you to hate these people. The system is telling you that they are different and that's not okay. The enemy is telling you that it, your life would be better like or oh, it'd be better without them, right? Like we have a certain way of living here. Like you if you accept that 
we can get rid of the people that don't want to live that way and life will just be better, right? That's the enemy. People who with that kind of think behind them. That's who we are really like or or the book seemingly is against. And so yeah, like while I, I wish I could be more conclusive about this, because I think the book I think that's what makes it like an, a compelling piece of like literature as well, is like it doesn't definitively land on one side or the other. I think it kind of has its foot in both camps. I think it's kind of saying empathy, hope, but at the same time, bleakness and things might get worse before they get better. And what sucks about that is how realistic it is. And what sucks is that like, it's not like the feel good story of the year where people, a turf woman overcomes her transphobia and lives happily ever after with a trans woman. Like that's not the story that we get. And we get one that's very complicated with people with two people who seemingly aren't very good people, at least at this point in their life. And like, how they have to deal with very complex emotions. And, you know, it's it's a very... It's a tough book to grapple with because it's a very realistic book. And it, it deals with very real human things. And so, while yes, we all want things to be neatly wrapped up and like tied with a bow. Giving us this all-encouraging message of hope. It's, it's not really like the world we live in. And we're not really going to get that. And I think this is saying like... Part of it is saying like hope and empathy like aren't enough. Like we, we really have to be doing something. We can't just hope one day it will get better. Even though we have to hope it will get better, that's not the only thing we can be doing. So yeah, I think this book gives people a, a lot to wrestle with. It has a lot of ideas embedded in there. Obviously, like I we didn't even touch on probably like half of them. These are just the ones that I think are the most universal, are the most pressing, are the most of what is this book trying to say? And I think that is uh you know give, give give the book a read i think it's worth it if you can get past the transgressive style which again i will state i think it needs to be here i don't think this is a book that should use candy coated language to make the reader feel more comfortable and you know that's that's all i have read this book it is it'll leave you thinking for a while and I, i'm still thinking about it i've been done with it for over a week now and there's still a lot that I've like been wrestling with. And there's probably still a lot to be said about this book, but not in this episode. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel for more deep dive into books like this. I do not know what the next episode will be, but it is coming. I can tell you that I am actively working on something. So lots of other good stuff here on the channel. Check that stuff out. And until next time, keep reading good books.